As we stand together this morning as a congregation, you'll find a call to worship where we'll join together in the liturgy. It is a little different this morning. We will all bend, begin together, and then we'll all finish together. It's found in your bulletin, and it's also on the screen. God of tradition and new beginnings, create in each of our hearts thanksgiving and desire. Thanksgiving for faith that has nurtured us through generations. Thanksgiving for people who have shaped and molded us. Thanksgiving for the stories of faith passed down over the ages. Teach us to love, learn, lead, and to be transformed. Amen. Good. And all the time. We're so glad that you're here. And we're in the, the third sermon in our sermon series, Transform Living. And today we're talking about pennies, pennies in a fountain. And then in the next few weeks, we'll have a few more. And we'll end on November the 10th. But we're grateful that you've joined us in worship. We're excited that you're here. And we have opportunity to greet you. And I need all of you to help me. Will you greet those around you? There's somebody here that you've never met. Make sure that you meet everyone that you're able to and get to know new people. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us today.
I'm reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Listen to the word of God. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Charlene. I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward now for a time of tithes and offerings. I know y'all like these buckets. I hear you rattling them every Sunday. It is a joy to give, and I pray that we enjoy this time as we listen to the chancel bells as they're accompanied by Leah, T Leah Tingblad on the piano. But celebrate, rattle the buckets, and then quiet down as we listen to the bells. But enjoy this time of giving, because God has given us so much. We should enjoy what we're able to give back, because the blessings that we receive from God will continue on no matter what we give away.
Most gracious and giving God, we offer these gifts to you this morning in celebration and joy of all that you have done for us. May you bless them and keep them and use them for your ministry. And may we be diligent in our ministries and our gifts and how we share with one another. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. to invite you to be seated. Unless your name is Bobby, then you can come on up here. Bobby, you coming? I've got to steal some of my change back from the uh, offering. This is a first. You've seen the pastor digging around in the offering plates. Well, where'd all my pennies go? There they are. Huh? Oh, we got the, no, I got this one in here. I like digging around these buckets. Bobby, how you been doing? Good. You were... You're back now? Well, I saw you this week at school. I saw you at preschool, didn't I? Do you have anybody to share with? Do you have a brother or sister? Are you rooting for one? No. No. you got a brother and sister. We just don't claim them. i tell you what. I'm going to share with you this penny. You want to hold on to that? Don't eat it. All right? Do you have, what do you have? Just a penny? Do you have any change in your pocket? In your piggy bank. Okay. Well, that's not quite here. So I'll tell you what. I've got a dime and a penny, and I'll give you a dime. Here you go. Have that. Now, you've got a dime and a penny. That makes us about equal, doesn't it? I've got this quarter, but I can't break it unless I chew it up. So we're just going to leave that here. I'm going to put it back in the offering plate, all right? We're going to put it in the offering plate because that's where Pastor Lee stole it from. But we're going to keep our dime and our penny. Do you know what sharing means to God at times? It means a tithe. You ever heard that word, a tithe? No. There's a lot of people here who had not heard it either. But 
A tithe was originally the Hebrew people way back in time. See, they, God instructed them to give 10% to the, it wasn't the church then, it was the temple or the synagogue, but to give that 10% and it was to support the temple and all that was going on. But it was also to take care of the people that couldn't do you know, other things that couldn't work, the orphans and the widows and people when there was bad things happen, they'd take care of it with that 10%. So they brought that 10% of the first fruits of everything they had. They brought grapes and olives and wheat and everything they had, the first 10%. They bring it in and they store it at the temple so they could give it out to folks that needed it. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. Bobby's nodding if you can't see it. Well, that's why I gave you some of mine. I gave you half of mine. I had 22 cents. So now we've got... 11 cents each, but that's what I like to call sharing. And as you guys, I usually have two or three of you up here, but as we learn to tithe, what I want you to do is look at some of that change you might have or if mom and dad give you some money, and you just look at 10%. A dime is a good one because that's how many dimes go in a dollar. They match. They match, that's right. How many dimes go in a dollar, Bobby? I know you all do percentages at preschool. Say 10%. He said 10%. All right, 10 dimes in a dollar. That's right. They teach him a lot here at our preschool. But anyway, this dime is, that represents that 10% for us. So I want you to keep that dime and keep that penny. Don't eat it. All right, don't eat it. There's a fountain out there. You can put it in as you go out, or you can take that home and put it in your piggy bank because we want to share with you. Our church wants to share with all the kids here in our congregation the mission and ministry of this church, and you share with that with us, all right? All right. You want to pray with me, Bobby? Ready? So thank you, God, for sharing all that you have with all of us so that we can give back to those who have very little or even none. Amen. Thanks, Bobby. Y'all should give Bobby a hand. He has come up here by himself. He's so ready to do that. Could y'all hear him praying with me a little bit? Yeah, that's good. Our celebrations, our cares, our concerns this week, as always, are on this slim insert in your bulletin. We have uh, several things I'd like to mention and and others that we want to make clear of. Uh, Darlene Miller passed away this week. She she was a member of our church, but has been homebound for a very long time. So we uh, ask for your prayers for her and for the family. Her services will be at First Baptist Church in Bentonville on October 21st at 1030. So if you have a chance, we'd love to be able to go to her her uh, funeral and, and attend to her. We've been serving her communion for years as she's been homebound, so pray for her and her family. Uh, Florence Hill is not listed here, but she was in the hospital, went in Friday morning. We were expecting her at the pancake breakfast. I think she flips pancakes for us in the one of the rooms, but she wasn't here. Florence got uh, some kind of intestinal uh, infection and ended up in the hospital, but she should be. Hopefully she's home by now. She was going to go home this morning. Uh, Charlie called me early this morning. Uh, Tess Wittenberg is listed here as at Mercy, but she's now at Health South, so continue to pray for her and for Linda Moore as they're out of the hospital, but continuing to recover. Uh, Jim Shannon went into the hospital this morning. I have a couple other things that people have handed me during the morning as we've gone through worship, but Jim Shannon did go in the hospital this morning, for, so please pray for him. This week we are praying for the Forest Hills Church. I swear we prayed for them last week also, but they're going to get double prayers this month as we uh, pray for them again. But uh, remember them and all the other uh, families of faith here in our community. If you have prayer concerns or celebrations, there's prayer cards in the pews. And you can fill one of those out leave it in the narthex for us. We'd love to pray with you and for you. If we would now, let us go to God in song as we prepare, pre- prepare to pray.
Let us pray. Lord, as we gather to worship this morning, we pray for your blessings on this time. May we remember that we are here because you've given us a place. We are here because you've granted us a life. We are here because you've found us a ride. You've given us friends. You've provided us a car. Whatever, Lord, you have provided these things, given us the will and the way and the means. You've given us jobs and opportunities. Lord, help us to remember that all that we do is through your tremendous blessings. That We work and we strive because you have given us the gift of understanding and, and want to and need. And you have called us to be in ministry. You've given us feelings and hope and joy. And through these things, Lord, we strive to do what you call us to do. So, Lord, today we lift you up and give you thanks for being our God, giving you thanks that we are able to do all that we can to be here and to worship. Lord, we pray for those on our prayer list, the names we have lifted up today for Florence and for Jim Shannon, for Tess and for Linda. We continue to pray for Vernon Walker and for Pat Reed and for Jack and Emma Rose. But Lord, there are so many others, so many that we forget when we ask your forgiveness, when we forget and when we neglect our prayers. We ask your forgiveness when we fall short of understanding truly what it means to love you and be loved by you. So Lord, in this time of worship, we ask that you would renew our spirits and guide us from this place into a week of new beginnings, and new understandings, into your light and into your way and into your perfect love. Lord, we pray these things in your holy and precious name and we do so by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. come into a time that you get to have an opportunity to receive a gift and the ushers are coming forward and they are going to present you a gift Bobby got a gift right I want you to know I didn't steal these gifts out of the offering plate like Pastor Lee these we want you to take a penny everybody's getting a penny and you can thank Pastor Lee because he had a he had a penny jar that he brought and you can Thank Chick-fil-A, because I went in there and bagged $3 worth of pennies out of them, and, and they helped me out with that. But please, everybody will take a penny. Um, just take one. You know, Don't take one for your neighbor at home or anybody else. Just take a penny. Everybody get, gets a penny. And as you're getting pennies, I want to invite Tim Harris to come forward. Tim is a co-chair with Mary Ann Johnson for our Transform Living Stewardship emphasis, and Tim is going to introduce... a. Uh, a video from one of our new church members. She's a, it's a young lady who has, she and her family, her husband and two children become of our church family. And we're so excited to introduce her to you. Thank you, Tim. Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. And this is the third week now that we have introduced um, a video testimony. Previous two weeks, myself and, and Dr. Mary Ann Johnson introduced each other. So now today, I get to introduce someone new to you. Her name is Ashley DeGraff. Her husband's name is Brian. They have two children, 
um, Shaylin, who's six, and Bradley, two years old. Uh, Ashley comes from Daytona Beach, Florida originally, and her occupation, she's a full-time mom. And I think you would agree with me that being a mom is more than a full-time job. It certainly keeps her occupied. Uh, she's been attending here at First United Methodist Church now for six months, and she serves in ministry here, uh, in children's ministry, as well as uh, now she's into uh, some missions work. So please join me as we uh, listen to a few of the thoughts that Ashley is going to share with us. I didn't have an experience as a child coming up to an altar and accepting Jesus Christ as my Savior. My family didn't go to church, but I wanted to go. So I went with a friend's family. And so I knew Jesus. I asked him into my heart privately. But six months ago, I came to First United Methodist Church, Bella Vista. And that is when my faith really presented itself. I would describe my relationship with Jesus Christ as very personal and very meaningful. It is certainly a lot better than it has ever been before, but I believe that there is always room for improvement and that we should always be striving to be closer to God. I definitely see God drawing children closer to him I see him creating knowledge of Christ in the minds of our children. I see him making people more concerned about the number of people who don't know Jesus Christ. And as a result, that concern is turning into an action. The last lesson that Jesus taught his disciples before being betrayed by Judas is that he is the vine and we are the branches. And our job as the branches is to bear fruit. To bear fruit, in other words, means to produce good works. And as the branches, we cannot bear fruit without the life of the vine, which is Jesus. So I believe that God expects us as believers and as the church in whole to turn everyone into believers through Jesus and through good works. I believe that giving to the church is important because it helps us to acquire the things necessary to complete our missions. A few weeks ago, I told you about a young lady in our congregation who at heydays passed out information about our church on her own. She created it, she paid for the information, and she passed out. We didn't know about it until someone came and told us that somebody invited them to their own church. And this was the young lady that did that. It was Ashley. And so we're happy to introduce her to you this morning. Well, I invite you to join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony of your word. And as we share in it today, may it truly be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our way. It's in your holy name we pray. Together we say, amen. So today we're reading from one of the minor prophets from the book of Malachi. I invite you to take your Bible if you would like to or pull out a pew Bible there. You know, Malachi is one of those books that's kind of hard to find. It's in, uh, over there with all the prophets and we wonder, huh, who reads all this because it's always stuck together. You know, Gagopath, Zephaniah and Zechariah and then you get to Malachi. And what is happening at this point in time, we, by now, we understand what the history of, of the Hebrew people is. It's, it's a history of obedience and then disobedience and obedience and disobedience. Not unlike our own history. Where certain times we're obedient and then we're disobedient and we're obedient and we're disobedient. Well, Malachi is selected by God to be a prophet. And he, as a prophet, he speaks for God. And he offers words of instruction and challenge and change to the people. So you and I, we have opportunity to read his words that he speaks today. For this is what the Lord would say. And this is still what the Lord is speaking to our hearts today. So I'm going to begin in 
chapter 3, in the 6th verse, and then we will share in the following. See, I will send you my messenger. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm starting too early. Verse 6, and I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees, have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. The vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will be blessed. For yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, I know many of you are like me. You grew up in a smaller community where you didn't have a fountain in a shopping area or in a town square. But it was exciting when you did go to a place where there was a fountain. For me, it was when my family would travel to Little Rock or, or to Tulsa where my grandparents lived when I was a little boy. And then to go to a shopping area or, or a more populated area where there was a fountain. And then to be given a penny and to pitch that penny into the fountain and to make a wish. Anybody do that? Anybody still do that? It's fun. You know what my wish normally was? It may have been your same wish. It was, I wish I could have all the money in the fountain. Right? You'd look there and there would be all those copper pennies and dimes and nickels. And, you know, you'd get excited when you looked and you could find the quarter. And then, oh, all that free money is just laying there doing nothing except playing in the water. It could do so much more in my pocket. That's how we think. Money could do so much more in my pocket. We don't want to give it away. And so that's where we are. In the Hebrew history. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, they're thinking, I'm just going to keep it all for me. Why does God need it? Why am I going to give it away? Well, when we were children and we, we pitched that penny in the fountain, we were always encouraged. And people for generations and generations and generations have done this. Make a wish. A wish is an you know, expressed desire. It's a, it's a, a hope. And so... You make that wish. Well, the people in Jerusalem, God had a hope for them. He had expressed desire for them, but it wasn't the same thing they had. And that was that they would return to him what was fully due him. That they would tithe, that they would be found, and they would understand their role in giving, and that they would give in obedience. And so, God's instruction to them is bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough. And that was a word that was given to them. They were asked, why were they robbing God? Why would they cheat God? The words of the prophet were spoken. And they fell on ears that were disobedient. And those words helped them to become obedient. And they had to understand that they had to change their willful obedience into a lifestyle of obedience. And so God spoke to them about this. And he called them, he called it to their attention that all they were doing was cheating him. See, our sole motivation for giving, for tithing, it's not about a building or about a tax record. Our sole motivation is all about earning God. That's why you and I tithe and, and that's why we give. 
And the purpose of tithing, of giving, is found in Deuteronomy in the 14th chapter, verse 23. Where the instruction comes, to, it is to teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Fear here is understood as honor, as awe, as revere, as praise, as an expression of love. You and I, we're, we're called. God invites us to tithe, to give as a way of honoring Him. Of, sh- of really offering to Him our allegiance and thanksgiving. Now we know what a tithe means. Pastor really instructed Bobby in that. A tithe is it's 10%. And tithing is a controversial subject. I know that. Some of you don't like this subject, and others of you are saying, okay, that's all right. Others are saying, oh, but there's visitors here. Why did they come on money, Sonny? And some of the visitors are saying, oh, Lord, we could have stayed home and heard this sermon. But you know, what we're talking about is honoring God. Because that's what tithing is. It is God's invitation to us. It's not a human mandate, but it's God's offering to us. It's God's encouragement. It's God's invitation. And so we read the words of the psalmist in Psalm 116, verse 12, where it says, What can I offer the Lord for all that He has done for me? But yet, in Deuteronomy, in the 16th chapter, verse 17, the answer is given. All must give as they are able according to the blessings given to them by the Lord your God. So what can you and I do? What can we offer to God to give Him thanks and praise for all that He's done? And that is to honor Him with the tithe and with our giving. Thornton Wilder said in the play, and it was spoken in the words, Hello, Dolly, that money is like manure. It's not worth a thing unless it's spread around encouraging young things to grow. And that's what our tithe does. It encourages lives like Ashley's to be transformed. This is the first time since she was a child she's been a part of a church and that she's, she's demonstrated her faith in Christ. It enables lives to be changed and transformed. It enables ministry to take place in this place and beyond. I mean, the tithe is amazing. in what it does that is so far beyond our own thoughts and imagination to touch and transform lives in our giving. John D. Rockefeller said that, think of giving not as a duty but as a privilege. And it is. And God has invited us to be involved in a privilege. To witness our faith because to give is to witness our faith. It's to demonstrate our faith as an action. Because it's not about the actual money or the amount. It's about the act of obedience. No one knows whether you fully tithe or not. Nobody knows that. Only God does. It's something so personal between you and the one that loves you. And God really went easy on us in the tithe, didn't he? A lot easier than the IRS does. He made it a tenth. If you're like me, you know, I round up in my checkbook to the nearest hundred. I can understand a tenth. I couldn't understand a 15.6. But that's what he does for us. He says, give me this percentage so that it blesses and benefits the kingdom and people's lives. And then you have the rest to use wisely for your own benefit. The famous United Methodist missionary and evangelist, E. Stanley Jones, says that God is the owner and we are the ower. And this puts God in his place and we in our, and it puts you in your place. And you are not free to manage your own material possessions as you like. But it's God likes. And that helps us understand. Our giving, our tithing, is about honoring God. Now, I want to share with you some information. I've got some slides I want you to know about what's happening in our current community in Bella Vista. And, and then I want to share with you some information about our own church. So, so, Jim, if you'll put up that first slide. 
here you've got a, a slide, and it shows what is happening in Bella Vista, what's been happening over the last 12 years, and what is expected to happen in the next 17 years. For those of you that were a part of Bella Vista 13 years ago in 2000, at that point in time when the census was taken, it was indicated that there was just under 16,000 people that were a part of this community. And in the 10 years, there was a 5.18% growth so that then there was over 26,000 people. Over 10,000 people grew. About 1,000 a month. I mean, 1,000 a year. And then in 2012, the population reached 27,086, which was a 0.04% increase. And there's a projection that in, in the next four years, in 2017, that the population of Bella Vista will reach 29,612, which will be a 1.8% a increase in the population. And so when you break that down in households, look how it has changed. 2000, there was a little over 7,500 households Currently, in 2000, or in 2012, when, it, when the year ended, it, there were a little over 12,000 households. And in, in four more years, in 2017, there'll be a little over 13,000 that's estimated. When you break down the population between gender, between male and female, women, you're winning. You're, you're beating the man. There's a little under 50% of men in the community and a little over 50% of women here. And the medium age, you might be surprised to learn that, is 51 and a half. But you know, at 51, you don't want to count the half, do you? We could knock that off and be happy. And there, at the, on average, there are 2.24 people in a household in Bella Vista. And that, believe it or not, there is almost 4,500 children under the age of 18 uh, as of the last census in Bella Vista. And we know that is changing. Children used to be not the norm in our community now where we see school buses and we have a school and there is intention of other schools being built. And the medium household income is a little over 52000 but yet the average household income of a person that lives in this community it's just over 67,000. Now that's what's going on in a nutshell in Bella Vista and what will, what's gone on in the past and relatively in the present and, and for the future. But let me share with you what we can look at in our own church family of what's going on. At the year, and when we ended the year in 2011, when we did our year in reports and everything that we have to do for the conference, we, the year ended and we had, three, we had an average attendance of 382. Last year at the end of 2012, we, we saw a, a slight increase in our, um, our average worship attendance by 12 people. And so we ended at 395. Currently, as of last Sunday, when we averaged the worship attendance for the year, we were at 108. We were excited to see that number. And so for us, that means there, there are positive things happening. Now, our membership secretary is Arlene Alford. And Arlene is probably, I would dispute any other church that says different, the, the cleanest record keeper in any Methodist church, United Methodist Church in the state of Arkansas because every year Arlene audits the books as they're supposed to be done. And I've never been in a church that really did that. But she did that. And so her statistics are from charge conference to charge conference, which is not... January, December, but relatively November to November. And so she has discovered that we are, we are three up over last year in charge conference in our, in our, in our losses and our gains. We, we've gained 65 persons uh, that become a part of our church family, whereas the last year we, we had gained 52. But for the first time in several years, we have gained, we've had more of a gain than a loss by three when we turn in our charge conference form this year and faith and we are grateful to have people come and, and visit our congregation and some people decide to stay and, and others go on
because they know that there's a, there's a place that's better suited for them. And our concern is that people find their home where it's best for them in their church home so that they can grow and become involved in God's kingdom. Not everybody likes the same hamburger, but yeah, there's only one hamburger, right? That's why we got Burger King and Five Guys and McDonald's and all, Wendy's and all. But it's everybody's savoring a hamburger. And so it's all about the Lord. And so if one flavor is better than another, that's fine. But what we have discovered for our own church is that around 75% of the persons that actually come and continue visiting with us make this their church home. And so we're, we're excited about that. So as of January to this past till today, 55 persons have become part of our church family. We, we share in the sorrowful rejoicing that 21 persons in our church family have passed away. In last year, when we, when we really had to think about our, our upcoming year, 192 of you were faithful in your pledging, and you, you committed to pledging. But yet, 392, 200 more of you gave than had pledged. So we're blessed by that, and we're grateful. I was excited to see that we have 30 persons in our church family that give 3,000 and up over a year's time. And out of those 34 of those persons that give are your own staff members that are faithful in their tithe and give sacrificially for the Lord. So this coming week, you're going to receive something in the mail. We will, you're going to receive something that looks like this. And you've, you've gotten them before if you've been a part of the church. This is your Transformed Living Every Member in Ministry catalog. And in this catalog, you will find opportunities for you to become in Involved in ministry. And maybe there's new ministries that you would prefer to be involved in. Or the ones that you were involved in last year. Or maybe you weren't involved in a ministry. Anything. And this year you want to get involved. Or maybe you're happy with what you're doing. And you want to commit in that ministry. Because some, uh, some of you are so happy. And you're so content in what you're doing. And you do it excellently. And so we encourage you to stay. We have people that are involved in shoebox ministry. And shoebox ministry is touching and helping transform lives by meeting needs. And I want you to know that at the end of August, there were 1,800 shoeboxes that had already been given out to persons that were in need with items that would help them and benefit them in their life. And that was because there's so many people that are involved in that ministry and are grateful and faithful. So we ask you, when you get this in the mail, to take it out and look at it. Next week, we're going to have a, a ministry showcase. It'll be downstairs on the first floor, as Jan shared with you. Breakfast will be served in one area, and you can tour downstairs because there are some exciting things happening downstairs. What used to be the shoebox ministry room has been transformed. And it's now the new youth room. And shoebox ministry is located in a new room that's actually downstairs under the sanctuary. And you will not believe of what, what that room looks like now. It used to be an unfinished room. Well, it's finished out and it's amazing. And that's because there's people that have been faithful in volunteering in ministry to make that happen. So we're grateful. But also in this you will receive a card. And it is a Transform Living Estimate of Giving card for 2014. And we're asking you to really consider the tithe and honoring God in that way. And if you've never been a, a tither, to, to even consider doing what Malachi says here. is test and see. The Lord won't flow up, throw open the floodgates of heaven. And maybe you'll commit to tithing for three months or six months or nine months and to see. God will not honor that in a way that is beyond your own comprehension. Now, our children will all receive their own promise cards. And the youth will receive an estimate of giving in which we invite them to learn of the responsibility and the privilege of giving to the Lord. And they'll receive that in their own classrooms and in youth meetings and all. But that's what we've got going on. Next week, we'll have a ministry fair. We want you to be a part of that. Come and have breakfast with us. And then on the second no Sunday of November, on that Sunday, you'll be invited to bring your information that you've filled out, you've prayerfully considered, and present it here to the Lord. And collectively, we will pray for all of this. I'm going to close with two little things. 
And the first is a story. It's a personal story, and some of you have heard me tell this story before. In 2009, I was reappointed from the, a church where I was serving in Rogers to go back to central Arkansas, which was home. And that was a decision on my own. I, I really wanted to go back and be closer to grandparents that were in failing health, and things were changing in my family's life down there, down closer to home, and I wanted to be there. But yet, I had a home here, and that was a difficult day and time here in, in our nation. Homes were more under foreclosure than they were being bought and sold. And I had bought my home in 2004 at the high in Benton County, and then I'm trying to get rid of it in the worst possible time. And it didn't sell by the time I got ready to move. But yet, I'd made an offer on a house contingent on a home inspection and on me selling my own home. And I was excited to have the house that was close to First United Methodist Church in Conway in the historic district. It was the home of a former school teacher that had a school named after Sally Cone. And I could just imagine myself living in this house and in the work that needed to be done. It was exciting to think about that. That year, annual conference, our, our yearly meeting of all United Methodist churches was in Rogers at the Hammond Center. And I was in the church that was responsible for helping host that. And during conference, it, word came to me that my home inspection was done and that the house had some serious problems and concerns. And so I had to step away from the house a week before I was supposed to move. Even, even though I wasn't able to buy the house because I had not sold the house in Rogers, the owners were going to allow me to live in an upstairs garage apartment rent-free until I sold my home. But... Sunday arrived and I was supposed to move there the next Wednesday I didn't know where I was going to live and I certainly didn't have a lot of money to spend because I did not move with a salary increase but, and I knew I was going to have new financial obligations there but I had to maintain my obligations of my home in Rogers and so I left on a Sunday afternoon on my way there to find a place and I, I thought, surely there's going to be this nice little doghouse in somebody's backyard that doesn't cost much money. Because I have this much money, and now I only have this much money for Conway. I got down there, and the, the next day, on Sunday, I scouted the papers and tried to find places, Sunday afternoon, evening. And then on Monday, I really worked hard, and I couldn't find anywhere I could afford because it's, it's a town with three colleges in it. So I came back home to Rogers. And then on Tuesday, we, a group of people were helping me take a load of stuff out of my office and not a lot of household belongings, but just extra stuff to Conway. And on the way there, a lady called. who was I had not met her before, but she was a member of the church where I was going, and she was secretary of the president of Hendricks College. And she said, I hear you need a place. I think I can help you out. And it was a blessing because she found me housing in a place where some of the visiting professors would stay. And so for the next five weeks, I just slept on the floor in that apartment, but I had a roof and I had air conditioning. And uh, it was all right. It was cost me $800. In that time, I found a place to live by a former roommate, I mean, by a former landlord, because I had gone to school in Conway. And a house came available he had, and I said, I'll take it sight unseen, because I could not find a place to live. And the rent was going to be 600 and I was excited. So, so now I had a $600 a month rent, and then I had the expenses in Rogers, and I had all the things that go, lights, electricity, gas, all that. I'm thinking, how am I going to balance this? And then over time, one of my responsibilities by the conference to go in that church was to discover what this church, church's um, challenges were in its growth. And one of its challenges was it had no money, and it hadn't been really truthful with itself. So that resulted in me having to slash my salary, $10,000. I cut my own salary. But I also had to do away with a person's jobs and cut other people's salary in order to allow us to make budget. So now, if you're getting it, I'm paying for two houses. I've got $10,000 less than I had when I started in this opportunity that God had given to me. I cut out everything extra in my life. The one thing I never cut out. Though occasionally I was tempted. Was the tithe. 
I never. Because I believed it was my way of honoring God. I fully believe that not as a pastor, but as a child of God. So every week when I wrote my check, I did it truly sacrificially. But there was always an opportunity to receive a blessing. And ultimately, I returned back to the same house I lived in. It was like putting toothpaste back in a tube because now I had spread out into two houses and, oh, I thought, surely this isn't going to happen. But it did. And I had an opportunity to come in here. And so I, I tell you this story simply to say, don't. Don't think that God will not honor you in honoring him. Because God will. Now you've got a penny. And that penny has two purposes. For me, a penny is a reminder to trust in God because it says clearly on there, in God we trust. So when I find a penny on the street or at, a, when I, at the gas station, or all, I pick up a penny and yeah, it's a penny and I love collecting pennies. But even more than that, it's a reminder to trust in God. So what I want to ask you to do is when you leave the service today, don't take your penny home. Stop by our little fountain we have out here. Some of the people at the first service said, what fountain? I thought, it's been out there three weeks and people have been running to the bathroom because they heard the water. Um, but they hadn't heard it. But there's a fountain out there. And I want you to simply... Take that penny and pitch in the fountain and pray. Pray for you, yourself and your relationship with God. Pray for others, but pray for the church and for our witness and our role in God's kingdom and our ever-increasing opportunities to be a part of transforming lives. Father, we thank you that you are a God who is faithful and that you love us so dearly. Now bless us and be with us as we go forth from this moment. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that in all that we do, we will honor you. It's in the saving, life-transforming name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And together we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Rescue the Perishing. I believe it's 591. I'm saying that right by memory. Um, we're just going to sing the last verse. I mean, the, the, the first verse and chorus of the song, that's all. If you feel led to become a part of this church family, you're invited to come. on transfer of your membership from another church family to this church family. Uh, if you've never received Christ into your life and professed your faith in Him publicly, we would be honored to receive you on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ. If you'd like to be prayed with or for, we're here. But as you stand and as you sing this song, it's a song of invitation, but also it's a song of declared hope and of expressed um, desire that all will come to know the Lord. I invite you to stand and join in with us as we sing. this morning. We invite you to continually be in prayer for the church. Thank you for those who have adopted a day of prayer over these last 40 days for the church. If you haven't adopted a day, you still have opportunity. Go up there and sign. It's a blessing to look over the list of who all have signed up 
every day, and I, that's right by my computer. Every Monday, I get an update of people that are praying, and it's exciting that as I see your name, then I have an opportunity to pray for you as you pray for us. So thank you for that. God is a God who's faithful. He's faithful in our past. He's faithful in our present. And he's faithful for our future. And you know, we're not supposed to simply come to church, but what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be the church. God bless you. Have a great day.